Allow me to also say welcome to Christ Church. I'm so thankful that you are here this morning and that we have the chance to be gathered together for worship. Thankful that we can gather as God's people to lift high the name of Jesus and that the promise of God is that his presence will be with us and in us and among us to work with power and to magnify Jesus. My name is Nick. If I don't know you, I would love to meet you after the service. I have the privilege of being one of the pastors here and get to open God's word on a regular basis here at Christ Church Central Phoenix. And I'm so thankful to do that again today. I'm particularly thankful to do it here. It is good to be home. I've been out for two weeks. I think that's two weeks too many. Um, I, I just like love being here. I feel like Dorothy. I'm walking around constantly saying there is no place like home. There's no place like home. That's certainly true for me and my church family. Uh, yesterday, Rachel, my wife, said to our little boy, Titus, she said, Titus, we get to go to our church this weekend. <laughs> and he was like, he goes, our church? And she was like, yeah, our church. And he goes, he looks at Rachel and he goes, our peoples. He like pounds his chest and he's like, our peoples. <laughs> I'm like, yes, buddy, that's exactly right. That's our peoples. That's how I feel about you guys. That's how my son feels about you guys. You guys are our peoples. And so Oh, it's just been a joy to be back with you and to receive all the hugs and the handshakes and to be with God's people gathered again is just a joy and a privilege. There really is nowhere else on planet earth I would rather be this morning than here with you gathered as God's people. I, I love being here. Yep. We are going to finish this morning a series called Game Changers. The last two weeks, um, were you guys blessed by hearing from KJ and Adam? Did you guys have a good couple weeks as I was gone? They served really well with God's word. I'm thankful that you got to hear from them. And this morning, we're going to wrap that series up. We are looking at paragraphs in the Bible that have changed the lives of those who are preaching them. And that is certainly true uh, for this one in Matthew chapter 16 this morning. And so that's where, we'll, that's where we'll wrap up Game Changers this morning. So if you've got a Bible or you grab the one in the seat in front of you, open it up to Matthew chapter 16 and we will begin together in verse 13. Well, probably the most famous telegram ever sent in history is called the Zimmerman Telegram. It has its own name. Now, this was sent in January of uh, 1917, and this was a communication from Germany to Mexico that was intercepted by a group of British intelligence officers. Now, this was a group of what's called code breakers, which has always been kind of a fascinating concept to me because this telegram was literally just a sheet of incoherent numbers with no rhyme or reason. It was just a sheet of numbers. But this British intelligence group set themselves to the work of trying to decode it, trying to decipher it. And so they came up with what is actually called a cipher. And this is, a, this is an algorithm. It's basically a code that once plugged into this sheet of numbers changes it from an unintelligible message to a coherent message. And this British intelligence group was able to actually understand the message of this telegram. Now, the reason this is so important in world history is because the communication from Germany to Mexico was a threat against the United States, and this was actually a critical piece in bringing the United States into World War I and expanding the scope of that conflict to be truly global, the First World War. Now, what I think is so fascinating about that is that what was otherwise unreadable and unintelligible was completely unlocked and able to be understood because of one critical piece of information, this cipher. And this morning, that is how I want us to think about the centrality of knowing Jesus Christ in a life of faith. That's actually the title of the message this morning is Knowing Jesus. And this morning, if you would have a relationship with God, if you want to know the being that made you, if you would like to live a life of purpose, if you want to understand yourself and the world and your eternal future, if you want to serve God, then what you must do is truly know Jesus. Because that is like the cipher. That is the one critical piece that unlocks and interprets all of the rest of who God is and how this world works and what it means to truly relate to him. And so if you want to have a relationship with God, you have to truly know Jesus. And that's the big idea for this morning. Truly knowing Jesus is the foundation of genuine faith. Truly knowing him. 
not having some ideas about him, not possessing some data about who he is, not kind of being in a group of people who are proximally connected to him, but truly knowing him. That is the foundation. Knowing who Jesus is, the way he has revealed himself is the foundation. It is the firm footing. It is the rock solid ground upon which you can build a life of genuine faith. If you do not truly know Jesus, if you misapprehend him or you misunderstand him or you misassume who he is, you cannot have a life of genuine faith. You cannot have a real relationship with God. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father but through me. We have to know and understand and believe who he truly is. And that's why this text this morning from Matthew chapter 16 is such a game changer. Because of all places in the scriptures, this is the most accurate and concise statement of the person and identity of the Lord Jesus Christ I think you can find in all of the scriptures. And that's why it's so precious. That's why it's so beloved. In his earthly ministry, Jesus Contrary to what we might expect him to do, he didn't actually spend his time trying to get the world to understand who he was. He didn't go global. He didn't have a massive marketing campaign. He wasn't buying billboards and sending out social media ads all across the globe so everyone all at one time would know who he was. He spent all three years of his earthly ministry investing in 12 guys just showing himself to them and being with them and dialogue with, dialoguing with them and ministering to them and teaching them and training them. And then guess what happened? He was so successful at giving himself to these 12 men that those guys went out and the book of Acts says they turned the whole world upside down with the message of Jesus. His whole message, his whole mission was to give himself in a tr a true knowledge of himself to these men. And that's why this text matters so much because it is a high point of Jesus' success in helping his followers to understand exactly who he was. And so as we move through it together, I want us to look and I want us to understand not just how Peter knew Jesus because that's the one who's gonna be speaking. That's the one who gives the answer, but how we can know Jesus. So let's look together at the word of God in Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Truly knowing Jesus is the foundation of genuine faith. And so this morning it would be good for us to ask and answer this question for ourselves as we move through the text. How can I truly know Jesus? We see here that Peter knew Jesus. He nails it. But the question that must sit on us is how can we truly know him? How can I truly know Jesus? I want to show you in the text four ways to truly know Jesus. And here's the first one. To truly know Jesus, I must, number one, escape the error. To truly know Jesus, I must escape the error. Jesus uh, begins, this text begins by saying they, they went to a district called Caesarea Philippi, which was outside of the normal geographical bounds of where Jesus ministered. Now, him and his ministry team, this 12 disciples, they were busy guys. And if you read through the Gospels, you'll know that oftentimes from dawn until dusk, they were teaching and ministering and healing. They were going hard and they were expending their energy. They were preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus was healing. His reputation was growing and thousands and thousands of people were coming. And it seems like in this moment, he moves outside of the normal geographical area of his ministry for a little reprieve with his crew. So he can go and sit with them and maybe take a rest with them and pray and they can 
talk with one another and they can have this critical conversation here. This is a bit of a retreat. And at the beginning of this retreat, Jesus, he takes a survey of popular opinion surrounding his identity with his disciples. And he asked them this question. Look at verse 13. Now, when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? Now, son of man is one of his favorite titles for himself. And so he's going to his disciples and he's asking them, who do the people say that I am? And he's asking the right people because these were Jesus's like ministry team. This was, this was, these were his boys who were actually interacting with a lot of the people. And so they on the regular would have been having conversations with people about what they thought about who Jesus was because they're the ones interacting. They're serving food. They're teaching people. They're working alongside Jesus. And so as they minister and they have these conversations, they were well tuned to what people were thinking about who Jesus was. They were having those kinds of conversations over and over again. So he says to them, he asks them, who do the people think that I am? Now, all of them collectively are going to answer here, and they're going to give a total of four answers. All of them center on the office of the prophet. Here's what they say. Some say, verse 14, they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So there's four answers here. First, they say, well, some people think you're John the Baptist. And what does that mean? Well, chances are John the Baptist had already died by this point of Jesus's ministry, but his own influence in this region of the world, remember, you've been following along in the gospel of John, it was meteoric. Thousands of people came to see the ministry of John. He taught with power. He was baptizing for repentance. He was a huge, huge deal. And then he was unceremoniously beheaded by King Herod. And so they probably thought, hey, maybe this is John the Baptist reincarnate, back to pick up his ministry where he left off. Jesus and his team, they were baptizing as well. So they thought maybe this is like a continuation of what John the Baptist was doing. They also say, some say Elijah, others say Elijah. Now, if you're familiar with the story of the Old Testament, Elijah didn't actually die. He was carried up into heaven. And then there was a prophecy about him that he would return to pave the way for the Messiah. Now, so people thought, well, maybe this is the guy who came to pave the way for the real guy. And so he's back in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Maybe he kind of just descended from heaven with a different look or who knows what he looked like. And he's here to tell us that the Messiah is coming. Maybe this is Elijah. And then they say, Jeremiah. Jeremiah was known as the prophet of judgment and Jesus, had so, he had at times a pretty dim view of the religious establishment of the day and had some pretty harsh words and conclusions for them. And so people thought maybe, maybe this is the prophet Jeremiah and he's come to bring judgment on God's people for the way that they have strayed from what God wants. And then people who didn't have the guts to commit to a name, they just said, or one of the prophets. <laughs> Maybe just it's one of the people who speaks with authority on behalf of God. I don't want to commit to any guesses, but I think he's just a prophet. Now, these are favorable estimations of Jesus, all about the prophetic, and obviously a bunch of people believed them. However, just because a lot of of people believe something does not make it true. Do you know that? There's a, a, this kind of funny story about Jerry Seinfeld, which if you're in my generation, you probably didn't grow up watching him uh, do stand-up comedy, but he's like one of the most famous stand-up comedians ever. And he is renowned for his discipline and commitment in his craft of writing jokes. Rather than waiting for inspiration to strike and on days when he feels like he's funny, he just commits himself to the work of writing jokes on the regular like it's his job. Now, there's this story that motivational speakers and like life coaches kind of picked up about Jerry Seinfeld's life. There's this story that he has a physical calendar by like on his desk and every day that he writes a joke, he goes to the calendar and he marks an X. So like no matter how he feels or what's going on in his life, he's committed to the craft and he marks an X. And so these motivational speakers guys are like, be like Seinfeld and mark an X and just do it every day, no matter what you feel like. The problem is he has no calendar and it literally doesn't exist. And he's actually come out publicly and like mocked this idea. He doesn't even know where it came from. It's just like this urban legend that enough people started parroting and then people just think it's true and it's not actually even true. Now, something like Jerry Seinfeld, just because a lot of people believe it doesn't make it true and the stakes are very low when it's Jerry Seinfeld X's on the calendar. But when it is the person of Jesus Christ, the stakes are eternal. 
The stakes could not possibly be any higher on getting him right or getting him wrong. That's what Jesus says. Remember I quoted it earlier? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. That's literally Jesus saying, if you don't know me, you can't have a relationship with God. None. It is eternally important that we get Jesus right. The problem is that oftentimes we are swayed into taking our cues about who Jesus is from the court of public opinion, and we need to refuse to do that any longer. We, as God's people, need to put a full stop on taking what we believe about Jesus from any source other than the word of God. We need to take it away from the people even in our circle, from social media, from the internet, from the watching world, and we need to get our information about who Jesus is from his word. One of the things that I think is desperately lacking in the church today is what I would call discernment is the ability to distinguish between truth and error. We have so lost our roots in the word of God that we can be swayed by some joker of a TikTok theologian who posts 14 second videos and somehow is convincing people to leave orthodox, historic, Christian theology that has stood the test of 2,000 years of time. Like we've completely lost our marbles. We've lost our historical understanding and our roots in God's word. And we need to pick up again our powers of discernment, which belong to the church, to actually recognize and reject all of the errors about Jesus. And there are many of them. They knock on your door all the time. They fill your social media feeds all the time. You hear about them in conversations. When you tell somebody you go to church, you will often hear in return misconceptions about who Jesus is. And we need to be the people who escape all of the errors about who he is. What's so interesting about this is that all of these ideas about Jesus are, they're positive They're even sort of like reverential about Jesus is this great figure. He's a prophet. He speaks with authority from God. And yet they fall tragically and eternally short of the fullness of the identity of Jesus. Oftentimes, even though we live in a culture that is growing gradually more and more hostile towards the things of God, more often than not, what the errors that you will encounter about Jesus are not openly like belligerent and hostile towards Jesus. They're just kind of like, they're just like loose-lipped approval of who he is with no concept of who he says he is. You know what I'm talking about? People are like, yeah, Jesus is fine. I mean, he's a good like moral teacher. He set a good example. He was a martyr. He, he showed you how to die a death at the hands of oppression and injustice, but not fight back and be a peaceful warrior. Like, wh- That is nothing like what Jesus reveals himself to be. Even though they are like generally approving of who Jesus is, we need to be the people who escape the error of public opinion, go back to God's word to see the way Jesus has revealed himself and believe that. Escape the error. If you truly want to know Jesus, you have to identify and reject every false understanding of who he is. And you will be assailed with them day in and day out. So get your discernment pants on, put your, put your Bible glasses on and get ready to escape the error of who Jesus is. We can't just stop at rejecting the negative. We also have to embrace the positive and that's what Jesus does next. The second way to truly know Jesus, not just do I have to escape the error, but I have to confess the Christ. To truly know Jesus, I must confess the Christ. At this point in, in this conversation with them, Jesus shows that he's not, he's not actually ultimately concerned with what the crowd thinks about him. He's concerned about what his guys think about him, what his disciples think about them. Because notice, he doesn't even take the time to kind of correct the misapprehensions of the culture at large. He actually just instead zooms in on them. Look at verse 15. He, that's Jesus, said to them, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? (laughs) This is, this is so good. What Jesus does is it's almost like he, he's drawing their attention to like the mass, to the crowd, to the multitudes. And then what he does is he narrows the focus and he zooms right into them. It's almost like what it feels like when you're in like you know, if you went to college and you're in a big lecture hall in like freshman biology with 150 people, and then all of a sudden the teacher goes from talking to the crowd to talking to you, 
Like in a room like this, like I'm kind of talking generally to everybody, but what if I was like, hey, Michael, you, who do you think that I am? And and like in this moment, what's happening is like there's this big room of people here, but all of a sudden we're zoomed in right here. And this is what This is what Jesus is doing is he's actually, he's zooming right in, not to corporate opinion, but to personal declaration of who Jesus is. And this is a question, the same question that Jesus gives to Peter here, that's a question that has to face every individual person in this room this morning. Because I think oftentimes what we would like to do is kind of rest on the general corporate approval of who Jesus is. Like even in a room like this, we are liable to say, well, I go to Christ church and Christ church believes in Jesus, so I must believe in Jesus. That's not how it works. Because on, on the day that you breathe your last breath or the Lord Jesus returns, Christ church as a corporate entity will not stand before God to give an account about how they handled Jesus. You will, as an individual person. You will stand before God. And so you, if I could sit with every one of you, I would. And, and I would ask you, I would look in your eyes and I would ask you, who do you say that Jesus is? Who is he? And, and my, my burden for you is that you would actually have the humility to face up to that question this morning and have an answer for yourself. Not for this church, not for the people in your row, not for your family, not from the school you went to. I don't care about any of that. For you and your soul, between you and God, who do you say that Jesus is? That's the question that is asked to these disciples. And the reason that this passage is so well loved is because Peter nails it. And I love this so much. Peter just like crushes it. And the reason this makes me so happy is because I'm a raging know-it-all and I love having the right answer. <laughs> like Rachel and I, we, we often joke about how different we are in this. Like when a teacher in a class would ask a question, the teacher can't even get the question finished out of their mouth. And I'm like, hand up, like I want to answer. Even if I don't know the answer, Rachel could be like crystal clear, rock solid. She knows the answer and she like slinks into her chair, like don't call on me. And even if I don't know, I will raise my hand. And then if the teacher calls on me and my answer is wrong, I will argue with the teacher that my answer is right. Because I just am a raging know-it-all. I just want to be right. And what I love so much here is that Peter gets it as right as right can be. In answer to this question, who is Jesus? There in, I would argue, in all of the scriptures, there is not a more clear, concise, and accurate summary of the identity of Jesus of Nazareth than here. Peter crushes it, and that's why we love this passage so much. That's why it is a game changer. Look at what he says. Verse 16, notice that he said to them, plural, and then Simon Peter, as the spokesperson for the apostolic band, he speaks up individually, and he says this. Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. There are three primary parts to this answer. First, he says, you are the Christ, which is a title. This is not Jesus' last name. Christ is the Greek word for the Hebrew title, Messiah. This means you are the Messiah. You are the anointed servant of God who is the culmination of all of God's promises for final rescue and deliverance. You are the fulfillment of all of the prophets longing for salvation and healing. You are the fulfillment of the longing of God's people for a new covenant when our hearts of stone would be taken out and the law would be written on our hearts. You are it. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah. That's what he's saying. He's giving him a title. He is the figure in all of redemptive history that was called and equipped and empowered by God to fully and finally save God's people. He is the Christ, the Messiah. Then he says, you are the son of the living God. Two important parts there. First, you are the son, which is such an interesting way to talk about Jesus because it means in some sense he is distinct from God the Father and yet he perfectly shares the character and nature of God the Father. Just as a son is distinct from his father but shares his character and shares his nature, shares his DNA, so Jesus is the son of God. He is distinct from him in their Trinitarian distinctions and yet he is one with God. He is God himself. He is the son And then he's the son of the living God. 
over and against the dead pagan deities of the region who were, in the words of the prophets, who were deaf and dumb and lame and made of wood and stone. Jesus is the son of the living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who calls himself I am, who is the fountain of all existence and is for all eternity from beginning to end. He is the son of the living God. This is who Jesus is. He is the Christ, the son of the living God. And this identity that Peter nails is the, is the reason that Jesus is able to operate as the rescuer of all of mankind. Because he is, he's the savior because of his divine identity and how he was filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit, he's the savior who was uniquely capable to live a life of impeccable obedience to the law of God. Everywhere that you and I, because of our sin, had failed and messed up and transgressed God's law, he kept it perfectly. But not only was he the spotless savior, he's also the substitute for sinners. And taking his divine identity and his perfect record all the way to the cross, he hangs in the place of sinners, not just so that he can suffer a brutal physical death, but so that he can receive the full weight of the wrath of God in the place of sinful people like you and like me. And because he was the son of the eternal God himself, he was able to absorb it all. And then dying and being laid in the grave, he rose victorious three days later, triumphing over Satan and sin and hell and death so that every person who trusts him by faith, every person who turns away from their sin and abandons all of their confidence and trusts in the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God, who puts all of their eggs in that basket, who trusts in him, not in themselves, who puts their confidence and their hope for salvation in what he has done and who he is, every single one is rescued and saved and redeemed and restored and adopted into God's family. This is who Jesus is. He is the Christ, he's the Christ, excuse me, the son of the living God. Now this question that was posed to Peter on this day is critically important that we answer we have to come face to face with this question, who do we say Jesus is? Who do you say Jesus is? Do you take your opinion about who Jesus is from what other people say, or do you trust in the revealed word of God that was inspired and preserved by the Holy Spirit so we could know him? Do you trust in Jesus, do you believe that he is the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God? Because for you today, if you don't have a relationship with God at all, the way into a relationship with God is understanding exactly what Peter said here, that he is the only savior for all mankind and that through faith in him, you can be cleansed of your sin and set free forever. And if you are a follower of Jesus, you need to deeply root yourself again in his identity, not in what you can do or in who you are, but in him, in the fact that he is the Christ. He is the son of the living God. You have to confess the Christ. That sort of confession goes way beyond just your lips and it infiltrates your life. If you confess Jesus as the Christ, it means you receive him as your Messiah. It means you submit to him as your king and you worship him as your Lord. That's what it means. To truly know Jesus, I must first escape the error. I must confess the Christ and then two more that will come a little more quickly. To truly know Jesus, I must third, recognize the revelation. I must recognize the revelation Look at how Jesus responds to this answer. Verse 17, it says, And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. He starts by saying, You are blessed. He calls him Simon Barjona, which is Simon's son of Jonah. He like locates him in his family, him specifically. He says, You are blessed. You are favored by God. And then he says, For flesh and and blood has not revealed this to you, which is it's such an awesome phrase. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Now, sometimes I, I just marvel at how smart human beings are. I, I like regularly will be awestruck by the things that we have managed to figure out. 
Just consider for a, for, a, for a second, we just recently have like strapped billionaires to rockets and thrown them into space. Like that's kind of crazy. Somehow we figured to like escape Earth's orbit and go into space. Not only that, but just recently I was reading this article. I couldn't even believe that it was true. There's this whole like cutting edge of technology that's called AI, artificial intelligence. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a little scary. It's like the whole Terminator world. And recently Facebook has been doing all these experiments with AI. <laughs> There was an experiment that they ran. They had created these two artificial intelligence entities, and I'm not joking you, they were called Bob and Alice, and they started talking to each other. Bob and Alice started having a conversation, and at first, they were conversing in English, and then eventually, they invented their own language and started talking to each other in what to us was gibberish, but they were interacting with each other, and Facebook had to like hit the eject button and shut the whole thing down. And I was like, yes, please, because I don't want the end of the world to be that Bob and Alice started talking to each other, and then the robots rose up, and they exterminated all of us. I mean, think about this. We found a way to create robots who can think for themselves. And we invented contact lenses, which are also amazing. Have you thought about contact lenses lately? Like, you know the, you know the glasses? Like, Debbie, you're wearing glasses? They correct your vision because there's a difference in the curve between the inside and the outside. How do you do that on something that is paper thin? I don't know, but we figured it out. We're really smart. We've done amazing, amazing things. Here's what I want to say. No amount of human ingenuity or crafty wisdom or philosophical insight or scientific inquiry can lead you to the conclusion that Jesus is the Christ. It would not matter how long you searched, how smart you were, what books you had access to, what you can do. Flesh and blood cannot reveal to you. No powers of human intelligence, no endeavor of human pursuit can reveal to you the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Only God can do that. And that's what he says. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. To truly know Jesus is a gift from God. And so we just need to reject any arrogant notion of our ability to get our way to God and to kind of figure out with enough, enough diligent searching who he is. We need to just abandon that and we need to instead put on the corresponding humility and gratitude that the God of heaven in his sovereign kindness decided to open up to us an understanding of who his son is. If you're a Christian in the room today, if you truly know Jesus, that is the kindness of God to you and nothing else. God revealed the Lord Jesus to you. That's how you became a Christian. That's how I became a Christian. And if today you don't know him, but you would, if, if there's a desire in your heart to know Jesus, it's, it will not be because you answer enough questions or you read enough Bible passages. It will be because the God of heaven shows himself to you. And so today, if you want to know Jesus, you need to cast yourself on the mercy of God and say, God, would you reveal yourself to me? Would you show me who you are and open my mind and my heart to understand and believe you, that's what we need to do to truly know Jesus is recognize the revelation of God, the unveiling of God's nature and God's character and God's person in Jesus Christ. Recognize the revelation. And then this, the last one, to truly know Jesus, I must build on the base. I must build on the base. Peter made a very clear declaration about Jesus, and now Jesus is gonna make a declaration about Peter. He flips the script on him. Look what he says. Verse 18, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now Jesus is doing something clever here. He's, he's, he's got a bit of play on words, and if you've got a Bible with footnotes, you might see that there's a little footnote in this section. Mine is right after the word rock, and it takes me down to the bottom of the page, and it says the Greek words for Peter and rock sound similar. Now, I went on the trusty blueletterbible.com, looked at the Greek, and here's what's going on. Here, he basically says, you are Petros, which is a proper name, but it sounds a lot like the word for rock, which is Petra. So he says, you are Petros, and on this Petra, I will build my church. So Jesus is playing on words to talk about who Peter is and what Peter has just done in the context of this conversation. Now, 
If we translated it to English, he would basically be saying, you are rocky and on this rock, I build my church. He's giving him a nickname and tying him and what he said in some way to building the church. Now, what is the rock? What is the rock upon which he will build his church? Roman Catholic and Protestant theologians have duked it out in this passage for a long time because Roman Catholic theologians use this as their primary source text for papal succession, that Peter was the first pope and the whole church is built on him and his authority. I believe that's an error that's out of sync with God's word. And so Protestant theologians have sought to kind of correct that error. But at times, I think they've removed Peter entirely from the situation in an effort to do that. Now, Thankfully, I think Peter clears this up for us a little bit later when he writes his first epistle. Because in 1 Peter chapter 2, he uses two more rock metaphors. And he says two things very clearly. First, he says that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of the church. But then very clearly on the heels of that, he says, you, God's people, are living stones that God is building into a house and a temple for his Holy Spirit. So while God doesn't build on people, it would actually be foolish of God to build on weak and unpredictable and sinful people like you and me, or Peter for that matter. God doesn't build on people. He builds on the foundation of his son, Jesus Christ. That's what the book of 1 Corinthians says. There is one foundation that has been laid that everybody else is building on. It's the foundation of Jesus Christ. So he doesn't build on people, but he does build with people. And that's what he's saying to Peter here. He is saying to Peter that the rock is the confession that you have just made, that I am the Christ. And if you are the kind of person who will stand upon the rock that never moves, that confession of my identity as the savior of all mankind, then you are the kind of person that I will use to build my church. That's what he says. Now notice, Jesus is the one who builds the church. Peter is not the general contractor here. Jesus is the project manager. He provides the power. He provides the plan. He is the one who builds, and he himself is the firm foundation upon which the church is built, but he will use people like Peter. Now, we just watched like a month ago, the Surfside condo in Miami collapsed and killed 97 people. Why? Because the foundation was compromised. The foundation was the pillars in the parking garage underneath this condo had been eroded by the salt water coming off the beach and it was never addressed and it was never fixed and the foundation was messed up so the whole thing came crashing down. A strong foundation holds up the entire structure. It is absolutely critical. So if your foundation is anything other than the person and work of Jesus Christ, your structure will come crumbling down. That's what, that's what Jesus says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. He says, anyone who builds their house on the sand is like a fool. And when the winds come, it will collapse. But if you build on me, if you build on my word, if you build on my commands, if you build on the things that never change, you will be like a wise man who built his house on the what? On the rock. On the rock. We should have all the confidence in the world to build alongside Jesus because of the promises that he attaches here. Look at this. You are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Two things. Jesus promises to build it himself and he also promises that the forces of death and decay and corruption will not ultimately or finally destroy the church. He basically says here that the power of death and hell and Satan will not triumph over the church. Everything else in the world will pass away and fade away and succumb to death and decay, but not the church of Jesus Christ. Jesus says here, the church will advance in the face of adversity no matter what it looks like, and it will live forever and never die. And so my question to you is if you truly know Jesus, do you love what Jesus loves? If you truly know Jesus, are you building the only institution in all of human history that Jesus has committed to build? Are you building it? Are you building the church alongside Jesus? Because sometimes I think we can fall prey to getting so worked up and so focused and give ourselves so wholeheartedly to things that will not matter in like five minutes. And Jesus is inviting us to build something that will last forever the church of Jesus Christ. 
Like, do you remember the last time when you got so worked up about something, like you were angry about it or you were crying about it or you were gossiping about it or you were all worked up about it and then like two weeks later, you can't even remember what the thing was? You have an opportunity to shift your perspective away from the things that are temporal and fading and fleeting and to give your life and your resources and your time and your energy to the church of Jesus Christ that he has promised to build and protect against the gates of hell. What I love so much in preaching this message to you guys is so many of you are already doing it. Our church is filled with people who have opened their lives and given their time and their financial resources and who have served and sacrificed to move the mission of Jesus Christ forward here at Christ Church Central Phoenix. And we are, we are one little local expression of what God is doing around the world in his church. We're one little faithful expression, but please, if I could invite you into anything, and this is not even for the sake of Christ Church or Christ Church Central Phoenix. This is for the sake of the church. If you can find another Bible-believing, faithful church, please go give your life there too. But wherever you find yourself connected to the church, remember, remember, loved one, remember, son and daughter of God, that you have the incredible opportunity to participate in the local expression of the world-changing, darkness-defeating, Christ-exalting, never-dying Church of Jesus Christ. What in the world would we rather give our lives to than that? One institution in the world that Jesus Christ has committed himself to build and protect. I don't know about you, but I want to sit on my deathbed and say, I gave my whole life to building the church. I gave my whole life to doing what Jesus was doing and loving what Jesus was loving. The church is his bride. The church is his family. The church is his outpost for his mission in the world. And so we would do well to build alongside him. Truly knowing Jesus is the foundation of genuine faith. So today, if you would have a relationship with God, if you wanna know him, you've gotta know Jesus and you have to truly know him. You have to fight through the misunderstandings and misperceptions of who he is. You have to get to the heart of how he has revealed himself. You have to confess him as the Christ. You need to recognize that it is God who reveals Christ to people as a gift of his grace and then commit yourself, if you wanna truly know him, to building what he is building and to build it on the foundation of his finished work and his divine identity. Do you truly know him? Please, don't leave this room without taking some inventory of your own soul. Do you know him? And if the answer is no, look at me. I don't care how long you've called yourself a Christian. I don't care what family you came from or what school you went to. If in your heart of hearts the answer is no, today is the day of salvation. Do not harden your heart or stiffen your neck. Submit yourself to God and say, God, I need you. I want to know Jesus. And let us as a church family walk alongside you. We're in the same boat, desperately in need of the grace of God and having found it because he revealed him to us. So let's walk together as we pursue a deeper and truer knowledge of Christ that leads to obedience on his mission for his glory. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace. You have been insanely kind to us, God. You've revealed to us your character. You've sent us your very own son. You've ministered to us by the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit. And so this morning, God, I pray. I pray that you wouldn't leave us where we are, but you would, you would meet us exactly where we are and you would take us forward. If for us today we don't truly know Jesus, I pray that your grace and your kindness would break into our lives and you would, you would open our eyes for the very first time and soften our hearts, illuminate our minds to actually understand and believe your word and to trust in Jesus maybe for the first time. And if we've known Jesus for years and years now, God, I pray that we would recenter ourselves on the centrality of who he is, that we would allow other 
priorities and other things to fade into the distance and Jesus to take the prominent first place in our lives. That we would commit ourselves with every fiber of our being to knowing him. God, would you equip us with what we need in the fellowship of your saints through the ministry of your word as we pray to you, as we receive the the presence of your spirit. God, I just pray that you would help us to know Jesus, know who he really is and obey all that he's commanded and trust him, walk with him, love him, delight in him. God, our hope is found in Christ and in Christ alone. Help us, God, to abandon our hope in any other thing and to put it in him and in him alone. We love you and we need you. We pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.